uh, OWAS Bangalore meet. And today we have three speakers with us, Asim, Ankit, and Priyanka. And first we will go live with Asim, who's going to talk about owning your uh, PC with the uh, Inoscus USB drive. Now, uh, about OWASP, OWASP is Open Web Application Security Project, uh, which is a community uh, of developers, security testers, security researchers, or uh, uh, QAs, or people who want to contribute to the security community. So here we are, and I'll give it over to Asim so he can take it forward and he can share what he wants to um, showcase today. Over to you, Asim. Hi, everyone. So let me start with sharing my screen first. And then I would continue with the talk. So is the screen visible to all of you? Yes. Okay. So hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to the talk. So my myself, Asim. So in this, uh, so yeah. So in this talk, I'll be going through uh, how you could create your own bad USB. And that would help you like take over through any of the operating system like beta Mac or a Linux or a Windows. So just to create a bit of excitement there. So this is the device that we would be configuring to act as a bad USB. So I'd be going through all the steps and, and then there would be a demo. So before I start with that, uh, a small introduction. So I'm a security engineer at Rufus. And I also make uh, videos about security on my YouTube channel, Hacking Simplified. Uh, otherwise, I uh, tweet about some of the security stuff that I find or I find interesting from other places. I tweet about it as well. And then if I get free time apart from all of these things, so I do some bug hunting or uh, like just doing security checks on government websites. So some of the fa famous one that I did was one of the one was DigiLocker one. I did it when I was in uh, second year of my college. So there was an IDOR there for which you could leak a billion documents from them. So they acknowledged it and put it on the website. And the other one was a recent one about a hard-coded NPM token I found on a private bug bounty program. So that's uh, the bragging part of it. Now let's start with the outline of the talk. So there would be two parts. So in the first part, I would be covering the prerequisites or the what do you say the meat of the thing? And in the second half, I would be showing the demo for the talk. So in the first part, in the like the bad USB attack or the HID part, I would be talking about the device itself, the hardware components of it. And then there would be the software component that would be the reverse shell and basics of Metas part. So even if these terms do not like, if you are not aware of it, um, be stay with me. I would be explaining all of these. And then uh, I would also show you that where you could get one of these. And and it's very cheap, like around a hundred bucks. So you could get it from a lot of places. I would be showing those as well. So let's start with this. So the first thing is what's a bad USB attack? So USB is a basically a standard for like, it stands for a universal serial bus. And it's an industry standard for how devices connect with each other. So like uh, there could be like, suppose if uh, the pen drive is a USB device, so it connects a storage device to a computer and the storage device is whatever is there in the pen drive. And the other end is the PC or the laptop, wherever you're connecting it to. Other USB devices could be like your mouse or keyboard. So they act as a human interface device, like humans can interface with the computer through that. And USB acts as the bus for the communication medium. So that's that. So that's the USB part. And bad USB is when you configure these USB to not act like what they were meant to, rather in a rogue manner. So like this is a programmable USB stick. So I could like do uh, program it for malicious thing as well as for good things as well. So and you could just cover it in a pen drive case and you could pass it on to a friend or whomsoever you're trying to victimize them. So this would constitute a bad USB attack. So it allows the attacker to hack a PC just by plugging this USB into their device. You don't have to do anything. You just have to wait for around 10 or maybe five seconds. So this is a scene from Mr. Robot. So I think if, uh, because a lot of people are from InfoSec here, so I assume like a lot of people would have seen this. If not, it was, a uh, I think episode six or something. So this was a bad USB attack where the protagonist of the series they 
dropped a lot of usb sticks and one of the police officers like he picked the usb stick and plug it into his device and what they wanted was to get access to the police officer's laptop so once he plugged it they got the access to the laptop and through his laptop he got they got access to the jail system so they wanted to rescue a criminal from the jail so they had to do this elaborate scheme so let's talk about the attack vectors or the actual hardware so there are four of these kinds of things so the first one that i got to know of was rubber ducky and it's the um, like the costliest among all these but yeah with cost comes some benefits like it's highly reliable and red teams when they have to do some pen testing they prefer um, rubber ducky instead of this cheap digi spark one so the other device is the tnc usb which costs around 20 dollars and then the arduino leonardo board so that's around 30 dollars then this comes the digi spark 80 tiny 85 so 80 tiny 85 is basically at mega tiny 85 chip so it's a microprocessor number but that's how you could like google it and you could get the device from online so let's talk about the human interface device thing so human interface devices any like any um, devices that let humans interface with the computer so like you are using keyboard to type things on the laptop right so you are interfacing with the computer through the keyboard then there could be mouse and through mouse or you use the pointer to move it around the screen you move the cursor through the mouse right then that could also be a touchpad as well so these are all human interface device so keyboard mouse game controller touch pens all these are human interface devices now let's talk about the software part of that act so those two things like human interface device and the hardware of it so these two constitute the hardware of the attack now i would talk about the software part and i would also go through the whole like outline of the attack so that you could understand how these components fit into the attack scheme so reverse shell so reverse shell is basically uh, once you um, like put the malicious payload on the victim's machine so victim machine uh, calls back to the attacker machine and opens a reverse connection to the like victim machine so the attacker gets a reverse connection from the victim machine to his to their own system so that's basically a reverse shell mm. so i think that's clear so metasploit uh, uh, reverse shell is like you could code it yourself but i prefer using metasploit because it's a framework in itself which has a lot of payloads like if you could see the image on the screen so it has around 20 57 payloads exploit 562 payloads and encoders evasion tools a lot of things are there so it eases the job a lot easier and the, you could just like type a few commands i would show what are those commands and you could get the job going so you would have a strong shell on on the victim machine very easily so that's what metasploit helps so it's a framework and yeah it's quite popular known as the most used penetration testing framework it's open source you could see the code as well you could test it on like ubuntu or mac os so i have it on my mac as well as on my like linux laptop as well if you are using kali it comes pre bundled with it it's a ruby based um, penetration testing framework and it's it's very modular like every everything is a ready to use module so you could use a lot of these um, this out of the box from it so now let's squeeze all of these components together like how this hid how this programmable usb and metasploit and reverse shell how this all fit, comes into picture so what happens is this device is programmed to act as a keyboard and we make a payload through metasploit so that payload is like hard coded into this device and since this device acts as a keyboard so once it gets plugged into any like operating system or any windows machine or linux machine or mac os so the device thinks that it's a keyboard and so it they like there's no registration or as such thing so you could it could just start writing the commands on the victim machine as is so that's where like bad usb thing comes because it it is a programmable usb and you could pass it on as a pen drive after putting a, a plastic cover or something like those kind of thing so you program it through or like your computer and you program the metasploit payload into this and once you plug it into the victim machine the payload gets executed so i think that's clear till this point right so let's move forward with this 
So requirements for this. So you need to have this um, programmable USB. So I have a link for this. I would be sharing the slide so you could go through that. And then you need to have an Arduino ID. So Arduino ID is basically through which we are gonna like write on this. Um, the we are gonna write the payload for this. And then you need to have some creativity so that you could like get the payload going. So anatomy of the attack is again like this acts as a keyboard and it types the payload onto the victim's machine and we get a reverse connection from there. So without this, what you would have to do is like you would have to create the payload and you would have to send it in a phishing link or some kind of thing. But since you have this, you could basically type it on, on the keyboard on the victim machine. So the demo part. So since like I needed two devices, so I already made a video for this. So I would be showing this and I would be explaining each and every one, like each and every step of that. So that would be easier. So starting with the Windows Exploit thing. So first I've programmed this and this is the Metasploit terminal that's opened on my Mac machine. So Mac machine is the attacker machine. So let me pause it later. So yeah, so you could see that exploit. So MSF6 is the Met, uh, MSF console or the Metasploit console. And this is the exploit that I've chosen. So it's the web delivery one. So on there, uh, like, so yeah, so the modus operandi for the Windows exploitation thing. So in the Windows exploitation thing, what I've done is I've created a MSF console payload or MSF Metasploit payload, and it's being delivered through web. So once this device gets like inserted into a windows machine if the windows machine uh, asks the web server that's running on the attacker machine to download the payload and then it executes on its on the victim's machine so that's what you're going to see here so this, this is the attacker machine and this is the windows machine it had been updated and the windows defender was just run before so as you could see i was doing it two days back at around one in the night so yeah I think one day back, yeah. So I just ran the scan for that. Now I'm going to insert this on the mm, Windows machine. So you could see the sound comes and that sound is for that the device is plugged into it. So now there would be a pop-up here and the Windows are the run command shell would pop up here and the PowerShell command of the payload that I've inserted, that would be displayed here. So you could see that this is automatically being typed through this device. You don't have to do anything. You just, after it has been typed, you just unplug it from there. So on Windows, it's a bit slow machine, so it took some time. So I paused the video for a few seconds, but I guess in 10 to 15 seconds, it like the shell was working and I had a reverse connection there. So you could see it like, now I have a reverse connection. So. So what it's being done here is 192.168.88.235 is the like the a victim machine. So Metasphere is session five because I had already tried a few times back just to be sure that it's all working fine. And then this is the 229 IP. This is my attacker's machine and 235 is my victim. So a session has been opened onto that. Since I use the PowerShell, so it's showing that current server process is PowerShell.exe. But however, it has also spawned a notepad.exe so that I could directly migrate it. So I would be showing the code for it and I would also talk why I've done like this migration thing. So for, like wait for this. I'm just gonna show that as well. So successfully migrated into that process. And if I show the sessions, you could see that there's a metapreta Windows session that's running on my other PC, the victim machine. So if I do connect, so you could see that I got a metapreta prompt here. Let's wait for this. Uh, okay, so let me show the commands that were being run for this. So uh, this is the, yeah. So this is the Arduino ID. So if you are doing it for the first time, you would have to configure it to like add this library, digikeyboard.h header file. So it's not there by default, but yeah, you could easily get the instructions online. Like it's just like you have to copy paste a command and run it here. So it's quite easy. And this Arduino ID is available for uh, Linux Asim, as well as Mac. Asim, yeah. um, sorry to interrupt you. I, we can't see your demo. We can only see your screens, uh, screen on the Docs Google. So demo oh, sorry. Uh, is not very I think I, 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 would, I need to share the whole screen, I guess. Yes, let me, that's let me right. Do that. 
you were going in the flow so i did not disturb you but then oh, now okay. no, fine, fine. so if uh, you can showcase I... the demo once again that yeah yeah i would show i would show i don't see like there's only okay let's stop one uh let me know if you are able to view the screen is the is the arduino id visible basic keyboard dot h this file Yeah, yes, now it is. Now. And uh, are you able to see the this VLC screen? Ha, huh, we can, we can. Okay, so fine. I think I have to go with the demo. Yeah. So okay, uh, let me print. So so yeah. Mm -hmm. So this is my attacker machine. So this is the Mac PC that I have. So here you could see the MSF console screen. So MSF six and the exploit is a web delivery exploit. So earlier you could see that there are no sessions active, so that's why I printed out sessions hyphen i. And this is the Windows machine, and you could see that it has been just scanned, and today it was scanned at like 12:42, and I was doing this at one around 1 a.m. Yeah, so it was up to date, and the whole scan was done, so it was a protected PC, like it was not an outdated one. So this is the victim machine, so I'll be plugging this device into this machine. And then you could see the like the command prompt or the Windows R shell popping up, and the, the power shell would execute. So this sound is of the plugging of the device. So Windows acknowledges that the device has been plugged in. So on Windows, the exploit is a bit slow, so it might take some time there. But on Linux and Mac, it was quite fast. So it could be it could vary on by PC by PC. So you could see the command is automatically being typed there. So the whole payload is being written there. So once it has been written, you could just unplug it. And on my attacker machine, I could wait for the connection to come back. So it took some time. So I did a, I took a pause here so that I could like show the command when it, it was all successful done. So it took around 10 to 15 seconds there. So here you could see that, uh, let me pause it when the frame is fine. Okay, yeah. So let me explain what's going on here. So 235 is the IP, like 192.168.88.235. So 235 is the victim machine's IP. So you could see that the second stage or sending stage and the, some numerical number and the bytes. So that's the payload that's being sent from this machine. As you could see in the third command, like third line, 229 IP of like 229 is being sending the payload to 235 and that 235 is the victim machine and session id 5 so it's 5 because i had already done a few experiments before just to make sure that everything was running since it used a powershell so that's why it's written here that current server process is powershell.exe but it again in the next line you could see that it spawned the notepad.exe process and migrated into that so I'd be showing all these commands and how this was run just after this. Just let me uh, finish with this part. So you could see the session. So the Windows session is running. Now I'll try to connect to that. So you could see the metapeta from there. So this is the Arduino ID that I was talking about. And by default, you don't have this digi keyboard.h file that you need to include for like interfacing with this programmable USB. So it's very easy to install. You just need to copy your command and like paste it into the Arduino in one place. So you could find it online. I thought not to waste my time on that. So I skipped that part, but it's very easy. You don't have to do a lot of things. Then I've defined a working pin. So the light that you saw that was high initially, that was because of that. So there are two functions in like when you're programming this. So there's a setup part and there's a loop part. So loop part, basically it, what the function says itself is that it's looping again and again, whereas setup part is one, it's being done only once. So usually uh, the payload that you would see is written in loop so that like if it's not executed once, you could execute it again. However, you could see that there's an infinite loop in the bottom here. So that's to prevent uh, like executing the payload again and again. That's the very anti part of it. So let's go line by line with this. So you need to just uh, know a few commands and you don't even need to be an expert on it. You just need to know how you could use it. So digital, right? So it just sets the pin high. So the, so as to like light the LED. Then there's a function send keystroke zero. It 
just clears the cache, I think. I don't remember exact function, but it clears the buffer or cache in the device. Then you have to wait uh, for one and a half second or two seconds. You could like figure out the value. I figured that one and a half second was fine enough. So what happens is it basically depends on the device. So if the other PC that you are trying to target, if it's a slow device, I would say that you should increase the delay just to be sure that your payload gets executed. Because it could happen that you have like executed this payload and where, whereas your like Windows R prompt was not there. So it's better to like keep a delay and wait for it so that it gets opened and then only your command is being typed there. So the next command opens the like command shell, the run command shell there. So it presses mod GUI left, so Windows key and the R key. So Windows R is basically opening the run command prompt. Then it again waits for that to open. So it waits for one second. And then it types this whole command. So this, what it, this whole command does is, so it basically downloads a payload from the victim's machine, from the attacker's machine. So this is the payload. So it downloads it from the attacker's machine. And you might ask like how you could get this, yeah, this I URL, right? So I'll be talking about that as well in just a minute. So after writing that, it presses enter and this, Nop and hyphen w hidden. So hyphen w hidden basically hides the partial window after it has completed. So after this has all been done, it sets the working pin to low so that you get a visual feedback. Okay, now the LED has stopped. So it's probably, it has written the whole payload to the machine. So let me show you how you could get this uh, URL from where the payload would be downloaded. So this is my uh, terminal. So this is the MSF console part. So let me, so, so I have two handlers here. So handlers are basically commands or predefined commands that would be executed once MSF console or Metasploit is executed. So first it sets the payload to this. So if, if you're doing it manually and you don't have, you don't have it all written. So what you would do is you would first start MSF console. Then you would copy this and you would paste it there. And then you would choose the target, choose the L host and all L port and all these things. So this is an error. It's because I don't have a database running. So you don't need to mind that. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Let me copy this. So I, I've chosen the exploit to be this. And then the second command is set target to. So you might ask what's a target here. So let me show the options. So you could see this is the exploit target. So ID zero is for Python. So if I do uh, set target two, and if I do show options, so now it would be PSH. So PSH is for PowerShell. And L host is something, other option that you need to set is the local host. So once, because this is whole compiled into the binary. So L host is the reverse, the attacker's machine's IP. So that's why I've set up here as 192, uh, sorry, 192.68.88.229, then L port, and this is the payload. So let me copy all these. So you could see, so right now we don't have this L host and L port. Now, since I've set this, so once I show the options, you could see that L host is set, L port is set. So it's basically how you could, any of the module you could use in the Metasploit. So all these options need to be set there. So, and then, so auto run script, what it does is it uh, runs a module after the meta operator connection has been established. And the specific module that I wanted to run was this migrate one. So what happens is since the PowerShell window closes, so it's a unstable process on the Windows machine. So since you need to latch on a stable machine so that it like your session does not expire, it automatically opens a notepad.exe and migrates to that process so that like the meta connection, like it remains there. So, oh, I forgot to show how it was. So exploit was the last part. So once you do this, so you could see that local IP. So this is the URL that I pasted there. So you could do two things. Either you could paste this whole command instead of, oh, sorry. So either you could paste this whole command 
on here instead of this this like this small string instead of this you could do this but you could see that it's a bit lengthy and since it's a bit lengthy it would like take a lot time a lot of time there so what i do was i just copy this and I have this partial script that downloads the string and executes it on the attacker's machine. So that's all for this. So before uh, I conclude this, um, the Windows part, I would talk that how you would be using this to create a payload. So the, here's a verify thing. So you do this, you click on the verify so that it verifies whether this code is valid or not. So you could see that this is valid. If there would be some error in this code, it would show it here. Like if you have missed a semicolon or something, then you need to press the upload thing. So after uploading, now you need to plug in the device. So if I plug in, so now I need to plug this device into this and it would automatically type this out. So let me plug it here. So note down here. So yeah, you could see that micronucleus. And so once it's done, you could like plug this device out. So now it has this whole code written into its memory and it would execute like that. So I think that was clear. Uh, let's come back to the slides. So this was the modus operandi for the Windows exploitation and it's almost similar for the other two as well. So I'll be showing that. These are the Metasploit command. So these are in the slides, so you could go through them in later. You could do privilege escalations with other payloads. Then comes the Linux exploitation part. So in Linux exploitation, since the like the payload was very small, what I did was I created a payload and directly wrote it into this device. So it types these command on the Linux terminal and you could get a reverse connection there. So there is no like downloading the payload from the attacker machine and all those things. So let me show how you could, let me show a demo for this. Then I would show how you could like create the payload so I'll be creating a payload on my terminal. So this is the Linux demo. So this is the Linux, so ID Linux command. So these are called sketches. So first I have done the verify command, then I'm trying to upload it. So I've done upload. Now I'll plug the device into my Mac so that the code gets written onto the device. Wait for a second. So now it's done. Now you can unplug it from there. Now I'll be plugging this into my Linux machine. So this is my Linux machine. So yeah, this is the MSF console. Monthly. So currently I don't have any sessions active. Once I plug it in my Linux machine, I could get a session here. So there would be a terminal window that gets open and then that payload would get executed here. This is the whole payload there. It exits the terminal so that the victim does not know anything. And you could see the meta beta session has opened. So it's the Linux device, session side. I'm trying to connect to the ID. So yeah, so that was all the session connection part. So it was quite quick, quick uh, unlike the Windows machine. So let me show the shell command. So I will be showing the IP just have to verify that, okay, this is the attacker and this is the victim machine. So these all commands are executed on the shell of that, my victim machine. So once I execute the IP one, you could easily verify. So you could see that 192, 168, 88 and 22 is the IP that I'm getting here on one of the like devices on the, there and then the other device is 88.235 and I would run the same command on the terminal of my victim machine so as to verify whether it was the actual IP that I was showing. So to verify my claims I am just showing these. So you could see that the IP is the same here. So my, the video is a bit skewed here but you could see that 235 and that 2224 IP. So let me go through the Linux part. So again, you need to include the dgkeyboard.h header file. There is the key delete that I have defined here. So this is the code that uh, earlier when I did a demo, I found a better code from that. So I copied some parts from there 
but the modus operandi remains the same so first you set up in mode you could skip this it's just a visual confirmation that the code has started executing and here you could see that it's being run in the setup one and not in the loop one so setup one is like guarantees that it's only executed once here the i have set a delay of 200 so it's 200 milliseconds that's equivalent to 0.2 seconds then you set the p like data write one high so one high is basically setting it as high i is setting it as on then you are sending a keystroke to delete to clear the cache again you are doing a delay delay is very important because every time you do a keystroke sending or you do a operation on the victim machine you might want to wait for the command to ex get executed there then i am doing a alt control t so alt control t for linux machines opens a terminal so that's that's what be, is being passed here then i am pressing the enter key i am waiting for one second for the terminal to open then i am passing the echo command as you could see there and then this is the string that's being passed so i would show how you could generate this and it's being passed to base64 decode and it's being written to a file in the temp directory m shell so yeah i pressed the enter key there and waited half a second for that to get executed then you could also do a print ln print ln basically it does a enter key or new line it adds a new line so there are three ways to send keystrokes so send keystrokes hence one keystroke print writes on the screen there print ln also does the same job uh, but it also appends a enter so this part is redundant i i think i should have removed this here so after i have written this payload into into the m shell temp folder m shell file so i'm changing its permissions to executable so chmod 755 so these are basically linux commands you they, you don't need to have any expertise on like hardware hacking as such then i'm running it as nohop nohop is and as a ampersand so ampersand allows it to run in the background and nohop ensures that once you have closed the terminal the shell continues to get running in the background so if you remove this nohop and you like exit from the terminal session it would automatically get disconnected then i pass exit command enter so once you do exit for the first time it shows that background jobs are running so i'm doing exit again on the terminal so that like the terminal session gets closed and the victim is not in visor so this is all let me show how you could get this payload string so i'm using another tool from the metasploit Uh, framework so it's a msf venom so yeah so msf venom what it does is it helps to create the payloads so i am using the payload linux x86 x86 is for the 32 bit machines so 32 bit payloads would easily execute on 64 bit machines as well so just to be on the safe side i am using this then i am running the metapreter reverse tcp so you could as well use as reverse http or https i think those would be like better https one would be better i use reverse tcp because i have been using it for a long time so you set the l host and l port all these like all these parameters into the binary that's being to be like that's about to be made and then you pass on the hyphen f the parameter that you know, like sorry the format of the output so elf is the executable format for the linux and i'm piping this into base64 so that i get a base64 output because base64 is basically that could be typed through a keyboard because if i don't pass it through base64 there could be some characters that would not be able to type because it's a binary file right so this is the string that you would get and like you could change the los and l port and you could replace this string all the rest come on like till here you need to replace till here sorry so you need to replace this command this string with the payload that you have got after your l host or your l port and the other part of the string or the base64 decode temp and shell these all remain the same so i have all these sketches and how you could generate this msf venom commands on my github repo so you, i would show that as well before i come like after i complete this demo i would show that as well now comes the mac os part like the most interesting one i would say because a lot of people consider mac and linux to be unexploitable like by basic thing 
and it's not like there's a flaw in NAC itself. It's how devices are used to trick the machine. And I, I don't think there's, there's a very strong protection mechanism because like keyboards are plug and play thing, right? In Mac, there's a caveat that you have to set the string for a particular thing so that Mac uh, recognizes that it's a like verified vendor of a keyboard. But that's also easily available on the internet. So you could easily change that those values so that Mac also recognizes it as its, as its own like keyboard. So this is the Mac demo. And in the demo, I would also be showing how you could exploit it to get the web camera reverse connection as I explained in my Twitter tweet as well. So I'm plugging this onto my Mac machine. It's already been like, it's already has the payload that I created on this. So this is the victim machine now. And my attacker machine would be my Linux machine, the other machine which has been acting as a victim machine by now. So it's taking a revenge on it. So I've connected it. Now it would open the terminal here. So yeah, Spotlight is there. Terminal has opened. Now it's downloading the, so it has downloaded the OSX or the binary from the victim machine. So I'll be explaining how you could generate this OSX as well. So it's same as MSF when is used here as well. Now I've changed the executable. So you could see that chmod plus x. So I'm making this OSX file as an executable. And then again, using the nohop. So we have used the nohop in the Linux payload as well, as well as in the uh, like Mac payload as well. So now, so see the first time you press exit, it shows you that you have a running job. So you need to press exit again and do a enter there. So that's what I've done. So. Now you could see that I got a reverse connection on my Linux machine that was the attacker machine. So if you see the session, submitter beta OS X. So I have connected. Now I'll try to start the web camera on my Mac machine and see a live stream from there. So you could see the camera is on there and you could see myself. I was recording the video there. So that was all about the Mac exploitation. So there's a catch here that once you like uh, enable the web camera stream on, so you have to give permissions in the Mac. So like in the Android phones, right? Once the app requests a camera access, you need to allow that. So once you do a webcam stream uh, request from your attacker machine, you need to accept it on the Mac. So since it's being executed from the terminal, so it shows that terminal is requesting access for web camera. So you could be intelligent and creative. That's what I was talking that you could migrate to a process that that is more likely to act, ask for cameras. So like suppose you could migrate this to a zoom call and uh, zoom and you would ask that. So it would show on the screen that zoom is trying to access your camera and the victim would be like not wise enough and they would give the access to them. So let me show the Arduino file for this. Uh, I think, yeah. So this is what. Asim, just so, want to give you a heads up that we are uh, we have five minutes left. I hope you. Yeah, it's it almost done. So yeah, I would just tap it up. So it's the same thing. So I have just opened the spotlight here, key space and mod JLF. Then I've written terminal. I've, I've used the delay as always. Then you press the enter key and you download the OSX payload using the curl, and you create a like uh, executable out of that. Then you press enter key and then exit is done twice as I had done already. So yeah, these are the challenges that the first one device may not work properly. So you need to unplug and plug the device again because yeah, it's a cheap one. If you had a rubber ducky, you would get the reliability with the cost. So I already got like four of these because there was another problem with like AliExpress is usually delivering this. So these are usually clone of the actual devices. So since the clones are not very reliable, so by at the time that I was ordering around one, one and a half year back, so I ordered three to four devices. So since it were only hundred rupees, so I ordered five of them. So if one of them doesn't work, I would be able to do the same thing from another device. What's next? So there are other types of attack like USB harpooning. So instead of this, they would have a USB cable and it would be like any other cable there. It won't, you won't notice any difference. And you could click on these links and go to that. So those cables are like charging cables and they automatically does that and do all this exploitation thing. So any questions, if you have, you could like ask me here or you could like post me on Twitter as well, anyway. 
if you don't have any questions let me show the repo for this so this is the repo and i have all this i know files linux arduino msf and mac and this is the payload part so that's all from my side i would say